Hi, everyone, and welcome. We are going to just give people a few moments to join. So hang tight, and we'll get started in a moment. And we'll start in just about 30 seconds. All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of three of our webinar series officially kicking off the 2023 OVS conference. My name is Rachel Gentili. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm the Program Outreach Specialist in the Training and Outreach Unit at OVS. I want to just say a big, great welcome. I'm going to pass it over to Blake, my supervisor. He's going to give you a whole bunch of uh, housekeeping information and the such. But without further ado, Blake, take it away. All right. Can you hear me? Just want to make sure. All right. Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone, to the 2023 OVS pre-conference webinar, Helping the Helper, Showing Up for Yourself. I am Blake Cush, the Training and Outreach Unit Chief here at OVS. And just so everyone's aware, today's training features CART and ASL services. So please feel free to take advantage of those opportunities for you if you need them. Our director, Elizabeth Cronin, is in New Orleans, and she's attending the NOVA conference. <laughs> so she asked me to send her thanks and best wishes to all of you directly from Bourbon Street. So thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Uh, today's conference or today's webinar is the first of our pre-conference webinar series, which is something new and was was a result of some requests and feedback that we received from uh, previous attendees to some of our OV, uh, previous OVS conferences. <clears throat> What's exciting is that you do not need to join us in person for the 2023 OVS conference in order to access these wonderful trainings. So welcome, though we do hope to see many of you there uh, in just two and a half weeks, can't believe it's right around the corner. What we do hope is that you will get the most out of today's training opportunity. And should you wanna go back or revisit anything that was covered, we are recording today's webinar and it will be published later um, on, down the road and we'll share a link and anything, uh, additional information with that later on. So stay tuned. Other information will be always <laughs> about the conferences available on our website. So if you need access to additional information, check out our regular OBS. Um, website at obs.ny.gov forward slash training. We, we populate a lot of this information. Or if you need additional conference information, if you are joining us uh, in, on August 20, uh, 22nd, there's plenty of details and a beautiful, amazing, wonderful website that Rachel created herself. So kudos to her. And that's just obs.ny.gov forward slash conference. Um, so check all that out for more information and details. And finally, as, you, as soon as you exit today's webinar, you will be directed to an evaluation survey on the presentation. Please take a couple minutes to give us feedback. We take that feedback, we share it with Ashley, we share it with uh, any of the other presenters for future trainings as well. And then we make real-time adjustments. So if there's something you learned here that you think would be valuable to our next training, we will we will help uh, make adjustments as, as needed. And it's because of those evaluations that we were able to garner feedback that made the potential for additional conference learning beyond the two or three days that you're in person. So that's what led to today being an offering. So. We genuinely, genuinely appreciate that. And it really is five minutes of your time to just sort of share what went good, what, what could be worked on. So thank you. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley. So Ashley Lewis is the Vice President of Operations at the Family Counseling Services of the Finger Lakes Incorporated. Uh, she's current, she's, she is a, also a licensed clinical social worker and has more than a decade of mental health experience supporting survivors of trauma, abuse, and victimization through evidence-based healing center treatment. 
she has more in her bio. You can check it out if you need to as well. And she's happy to share more about her as well. So with that said, I'd like to officially welcome Ashley to the table. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And thank you to Rachel, Blake, and OVS for all your support uh, getting us here today. I really appreciate it. Um, as Blake shared, I am currently the Vice President of Operations for Family Counseling. I've been supporting survivors for well over a decade, and I specialize in sexual abuse treatment for children. Uh, so like many healers and helpers, I thought that I was just a special, a special breed, that I was not impacted by the stories um, and the pain that I was exposed to of others on a daily basis. Throughout our time here today, um, we'll talk a little bit about how that was not true for me. And I'm gonna guess that's probably not true for you. So I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about the impacts of the work we do and how to show up for ourselves. Rachel, am I okay to start sharing my PowerPoint? Okay, cool. So this topic is one that is extremely um, important to me personally and professionally. As a healer and helper myself, it has been part of my journey of self, self exploration and figuring out what showing up for myself means. So there's my bio slide, we already went over that. Before we jump into our content today, I just want to reiterate that today we're gonna to be reviewing trauma, the impacts of trauma on individuals, the implications of experiencing that vicarious trauma. So you're gonna hear language like victim, trauma, abuse. Um, I reference sexual abuse as that's the work that I have uh, supported for many years. So we just wanna ask you to please stay attuned to how you're feeling, continue to check in with the thoughts that you might be having, how your body is reacting to this content, take a step away as needed, do whatever you're needing to do to take care of yourself because we know that has to happen first before we can really engage together. All right, so I have been training, providing training for our organization for well over four years. And this is a slide that we always start out with. I think it's really helpful to set the boundaries and the tone for our time together today. So I again wanna reiterate, take care, please step away as needed. Um, as they shared, the content will be available later if that's something that would be helpful to revisit. Felt safety is really important. So we all have you know, our thoughts driven by our own, our own experiences, and we really want people to be able to share that uh, today in the chat, in the Q&A. We want to make sure that we do that in a way so that everyone is feeling safe enough to be able to engage and participate. Um, expect non-closure is a big one for this content. So Obviously, one training on the importance of, of healing ourselves will not be a one and done. The goal for today is that you are hopefully exposed to some new content, and that encourages you do, to do some self-exploration after you leave here today. So we're planting some seeds, so hopefully um, this content will be valuable for your own journey of healing. Staying engaged is really important. Learning theory tells us that the more you participate and the more you engage, the more you'll really retain that information. So I look forward to participation today. That's my favorite part of any training. And I always like to talk about the growth zone. So in order to absorb new information, we move from our comfort zone to our growth zone. And in between there, I like to call that our grown zone. That is when we are exposed to new content, which can make us challenge our own thinking. So I always encourage um, participants to not should on yourself. I should have known this. I should have done something differently. I should have taken better care of myself. Um, so I'm going to encourage no shooting. And I hope that you're able to sit with any discomfort of learning new information and please share your feedback. All right, so our learning objectives today, what I hope that we, we gain and talk through together, just understanding obstacles and resources, understanding that equal is not always equitable, even as it relates to any kind of self-care planning and how we experience stressors, very individualized uh, experience for all of us. We're gonna talk a little bit about the pandemic traumatic stress experience uh, PTSD, 
a little bit about the experience um, that has been researched through the pandemic, the impact of that stress and stress in general on our minds and bodies. And the most important pieces for me um, as a professional trainer personally, is that we are redefining self-care as self-compassion and showing up for ourselves in a way that maybe is not how it is uh, marketed to us through the media or you know, that multi-billion dollar self-care industry. Um, today, we're gonna cultivate some awareness and hopefully expose you to some new information that helps you on your own journey. All right, so that was a little bit about me. I would love to hear a little bit about you. I love to know who I am um, engaging with. So if you're comfortable, feel free to put in the chat your name and position. And another one I'd love to hear more about is what do you think of when you hear the word self-care? Hi, Rachel. Oh, someone shared that they think that the chat is disabled. Well, that is going to be very difficult for y'all to. That's so event. exciting. This is so exciting. We're doing it live. Bear with us. Yeah. We'll pardon our dust. We're going to try to fix that. Otherwise, in the Q&A, you can type in there and we'll keep an eye there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know that. That would have been kind of awkward. I would have thought no one was responding. All right. So as we're um, working to fix that, I ask this question when I do this training every single time, and I always love the answers that I get. Um, it's always very interesting. Sometimes the responses are activities that um, individuals do, taking time for yourself, all right? Our chat is up and running. Um, sometimes people reference the activities that they like to do to be able to um, take care of themselves. That's great. Uh, a lot of times I hear things like, um, when I hear self-care, I think I don't have enough time. Um, people have shared, you know, feelings of shame because we're constantly told we probably wouldn't feel like this if we just took better care of ourselves. If you're tired, take a day off. The weirdest thing ever is that that actually doesn't work because if it did, uh, we would probably be feeling a lot better as a profession, right? Burnout would probably be a lot lower than, than the rates that we're seeing today. All right, the chat is rolling now. We are popping, Ashley. Just a few Pop things in. that I've, a few things that I've seen. Uh, so taking time for yourself, uh, taking care, taking a moment of breath or movement throughout the day, spending time in nature. Somebody said self care is actually harder than we think, which I thought was a really interesting one. So true. Basic needs: taking daily medications, sleep, eating well. And I'll read two more, and then I'll pass it back over to you but we have uh, to do something to make yourself feel better. Some me time. I like that. Mm -hmm. Taking breaks at work away from your desk and computer. So very specifically uh, that it must be not in that space. Also taking a long hot shower, reading a book, making time for yourself. There's a lot more in here. So please yeah. everyone keep looking. We'll also export the chat, but back to you, Ashley. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so I love that. I love the feedback. And that's pretty consistent with the responses I get um, when I provide this training. I saw in the chat uh, someone's comment said, LOL. Agreed. That is very much how I used to think of the word self-care. There's not enough time to do it. What's self-care? What am I supposed to take a day off? That's crazy talk. Um, Thank you all so much for participating. We're going to circle back to these answers later. I really appreciate um, the engagement in the chat. My PowerPoint is now wanting to move forward. Please hold. Nailed it. Got it. We're back. Okay. So here you'll see a beautiful picture. Um, unfortunately, I can't take credit for it. I did, in fact, not do this myself. Our executive coordinator, Katie, who's here to support with uh, chat responses, I think she's actually the one that put, that put this together for us. So this is my favorite activity to do when I do this training. 
I will be fully transparent and I have not done this via Zoom, but I think we're gonna be able to navigate it because we are brilliant professionals. So I'm going to split everyone up into three groups. We are going to complete a simple task and I will tell you when we can start and I will tell you when time is up. So first, if your last name starts with A through H in the alphabet, you will be group one. If your last name starts with I through Q, you will be in group two. If your last name starts with an R through Z, you will be in group three. All right, bear with me. So group one, I want you just to look at this gorgeous picture on the screen, and I want you to use any resource around you to recreate what you see. And group two, I would like you to use resources around you and use your non-dominant hand to recreate this picture. So if you're right-handed, please use your left hand. If you're left-handed, please use your right hand. And if you're ambidextrous, please do not be in this group, you are cheating. Um, and if you are in group three, I would like you to close your eyes and recreate this picture. So I'm gonna give you about two minutes and your time starts right now. If you wanna repeat those, Ashley, I'll type into the chat what the different groups are doing. Absolutely. You've got to be careful, Rachel. You might be giving people some extra time here. So let me let me get that timer started. All right, group one, last name through A through H. Group two, last name I through Q. Group three, last name R through Z. Our, fir our first group right now is just looking at this beautiful uh, picture and they're going to recreate it. Group two is gonna use their non-dominant hand to create it. And group three, we're gonna need them to close their eyes and recreate uh, this masterpiece. And I'm gonna give everyone two minutes. We are down to one minute and 24 seconds. No pressure, no pressure at all. This is so fun to do in person. People get very competitive over this activity and I appreciate that. It's real dedication. All right, you have about a minute left. All right, new rules. Uh, the activity is over now. Please stop what you're doing. I wish I could see everyone's faces during that activity. All right, do I have any brave volunteers that might be willing to share their experience in the chat? Hoping to get at least one person from each one of the three groups. I hope I didn't raise your cortisol levels too high. I hope that by the end of this training, we will return to baseline. <laughs> My picture is beautiful. Great job, Rachel. Group one, very easy. Group three, just off center alignment. Oh, our timer just went off. Felt anxious, yep. Could have done better with the right hand. Mm -hmm. Beautiful picture done by a second grader, I love that. Laughing the whole time, laughing is good, I like that. Better than expected, fantastic. I appreciate your willingness to jump in that into this activity. It's always a fun one. It can be pretty silly, which I like about that, but it helps us um, start a conversation about a bigger, a bigger theme here, right? So I presented you all with a very simple task. You all had the same activity, the same task to complete. You all had the same amount of time. I intentionally made it a little bit, a little bit confusing. I apologize, but that's kind of the fun of it and the point, right? But based on everyone's feedback, your experience was different based on your resources, based on your obstacles, based on capacity and access to something to even complete this. Some of you may have created a masterpiece on canvas with oil paint. Some of you might've just had a napkin and a pencil. So your outcome is gonna look different, but your task was exactly the same. You had, I gave you the same, right? Same experience, but different outcome because excuse me, same task, different experience, different outcome. Oh, 
Ooh, someone, someone is jumping ahead. Equity versus equality. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So my clicky doesn't want to work. That's exactly why I do this activity because I think it's just a fun way to talk about how equal is not equitable. They're not the same thing because we are not starting from the same place. None of us. We all come with our own unique experiences, which means our outcomes are gonna be unique just as we are. Our ability to be resilient is going to be based on our unique capacity, our resources, accessibility, um, which then leads me to this slide and the pandemic trauma stress experience. That has been researched extensively over the last few years, Stanford, uh, in particular, has done a lot of work around this concept. And what we have found through the research is that some people truly experience the pandemic as a trauma, very similar to a classic PTSD diagnosis. Uh, in Dr. Bruce Perry's most recent book, he discussed that some people experience this pandemic as a stressor. Some people experienced it as an inconvenience. Uh, and some people truly experienced it as a trauma. And it comes down to what we just talked about in our activity. Not everyone came through this experience with the same capacity, resources, obstacles. Some of those are based in early childhood experiences as outlined in the ACEs study. We know that early childhood experiences impact our tolerance uh, for stressors. It impacts our window of tolerance is what it's called. Um, and then in addition to that, there are so many societal factors such as racism, discrimination, and equal access to services uh, that changed the experience for so many. So again, depending how you walked through the pandemic, how you came out the other side is very specific to you uniquely as an individual. What was your experience? Your barriers were not the same as my barriers. So your experience is not gonna be the same as my experience. So that is so relevant when we're talking about showing up for ourselves and what do we need specifically to heal. There's never gonna be a one size fits all. As much as the multi-billion dollar self-care industry wants us to believe, that's never gonna be the case. It is never gonna be just an activity that supports our healing. And I think as a profession, we are in a unique spot where we know that during the pandemic, we saw huge increases of mental health concern, more feelings of isolation, hopelessness, and our systems very quickly tried to adapt to that, to that need. The disparities have always existed, but this pandemic really forced all of us to put that information at the forefront. We have this picture here that I love. Um, if we keep asking fish to climb a tree, they're gonna think they're not capable because fish swim, they don't climb trees. If we continue to insist that every environment must be same, like one size fits all, then we're gonna be losing so much value because we are not building on the unique strengths of individuals. We need to know that for ourselves and honestly for our organizations. I say that to you as, a licensed clinical trauma therapist and as an executive vice president of a nonprofit organization. We need to have these collective conversations because if we just keep telling people to take better care of themselves, we are not gonna see the outcomes that we want. Okay, so now, oops, wrong slide. So now let's factor in that some of us during that pandemic coming into it with our own experiences, different ops tools, different resources. We're also frontline workers. Let's say that we were what we were called essential. We are essential workers. So regardless of all of those experiences that we're carrying into this pandemic, add on the pandemic itself, we still have to show up for other people, other people that are vulnerable, other survivors and victims of crime that were even in more potential, potentially dangerous situations during the pandemic. That's a lot, that's a lot. And so why do we do that? We do that because we're healers and helpers. We all get into this field because we have that goal and that belief 
that we are going to be able to support healing of other people. We do that from a space of empathy. Brene Brown talks about empathy and sympathy. Uh, she has this great like video clip. If you've not seen it, I encourage you to take a look. It's fantastic. And so there's this well and someone falls into the well. And sympathy is looking over the well saying, hey, really sucks down there, sorry about that. Empathy is when you grab a rope and you climb down into the well with someone, but you have a rope, right? You have the ability to get yourself out of that well and potentially help that other person get out of the well. So what happens when we don't have the rope? What if we engage in this auxiliary experience of showing up with someone, walking with someone through their experience, but we don't have the rope, we don't have our own safety net, we don't have a way out of the well. We're not really able to show up for anybody if that's, if that's the case. Part of what I think motivates us too is that compassion satisfaction. I always, to my team, I call it the feel good of the profession. When you have the privilege and the honor of walking side by side someone that you're able to see overcome adversities, you know, become resilient through horrific experiences. That is why we do it. At what cost to ourselves? And what do we have to do to mitigate some risk and truly show up for ourselves? I'm going to take a minute just to acknowledge this um, chat because I love it and I agree. Uh, so we talk in supervision all the time about not teetering in to save someone. We're not superheroes. I could not agree more at this time in my career. <laughs> there very much was a time that I thought I really did have a, a superhero cape on. And I'll share a little bit more about that in a minute. Love that feedback. I could not agree more. Thank you so much for sharing that. So stress. I'm sure no one on this call has ever experienced it. So if this slide doesn't apply to you, feel free to tune out. So stress can be good, right? And stress can be toxic. So positive stress, also referred to as you stress, not like you stress, but like you stress. Um, that is like positive, controllable, small incremental uh, stress that is easily buffered by social connection. So for me today, I experienced some youth stress. It is, I've done many, many trainings for several years, but doing a training where I can't see my participants is not my comfort area. So that youth stress, that positive stress, help me figure out how to navigate that stressor to show up here today. That's positive. That helps our brain to learn how to navigate stressors. Fantastic. We're growing that muscle up there. Tolerable stress is also referred to as negative stress. So an example of negative stress, I have a two-year-old daughter and we needed to leave for daycare today and we could not find those darn shoes. So for 20 minutes, we are looking in every closet, the garbage bin, anywhere you can think of to find those shoes. I was stressed out, felt the body temperature rising. I could feel my body tense. I was stressed out. But it was, con it was outside of my control. If you have a two-year-old, you know what I'm saying? So maybe not controllable, but easily buffered because it's not long-lasting. No long-term impacts from tolerable or negative stress. So then let's say that I am a single mom. Maybe I have no partners to support me. Maybe not finding my kid's shoes this morning meant that I was going to be 20 minutes late to work. Maybe I don't work for a trauma-informed organization and I'm fired. And now I'm fired and I can't pay my rent. I have no support resources. I'm facing many obstacles. And that's every single day. I have nothing to mitigate that. I have no social connection to support that. And I'm feeling that every single day. That's when that negative stress becomes toxic chronic stress. And when we get to a place of toxic chronic stress, that's when we're seeing a, an increase to those stress hormones. So we're talking cortisol, adrenaline, neoadrenaline. And when we're experiencing that, that's pumping through our whole body. 
so much research tells us that that's what leads to a higher risk of heart disease, diabetes, and impact to the endocrine system, auto, autoimmune disease, you're higher at risk for mental health concerns, the, the potential of the, uh, substance dependency. Uh, so again, tolerable stress, manageable, buffered, not good for us, but manageable. That becomes toxic when we don't have met needs and that, that stress is ongoing without anything to mitigate. That brings me right back to our opening activity, right? So based on resources, you completed the activity differently than another person in a different group. That's the same thing as we're navigating stress and trying to determine strategies to support our own healing. We got a couple chats going. Someone said, I always tell myself for every negative, there's a positive. Someone shared that um, it's about compartmentalization. It's hard to not want to save someone even when the client isn't doing the work. Mm -hmm. Listen, I hear you. I hear all of you. And the mind and the body, as much as we study those things separately, it's one unit. It is one unit. And when we say compartmentalize, I think it's possible to be able to be present in current time and face each individual thing um, within that particular moment. But I think that we still have to acknowledge that all previous experiences impact how we perceive current experience. Something that I've done over my career, um, I'm actually certified in the nurse sequential model of therapeutics. I've studied brain development for the last several years. And that is the biggest takeaway I learned is that it's all one system. It all affects one another, parts to a whole. So then what happens when we are trying to be the helpers and the healers, when we are trying to save people? Um, I'm a strong believer that we cannot save people. We can walk beside them to get them to a place of healing. But it doesn't change sometimes that internal dialogue of, I need to help this person, I need to save this person. If I do more, then I will be able to save this person. I've heard that narrative myself for many years. So I wanna talk a little bit about what are the implications of us having our own stuff, showing up for other people in vulnerable situations every day, and then maybe we don't have the rope. Maybe we're jumping into wells because we see people in need and we care because we are healers and helpers, but we don't have our rope to get out. So secondary traumatic stress is a quick onset. That is an experience very related to direct exposure to trauma. So an example of that could be as a forensic interviewer, I'm interviewing someone that's experienced physical abuse a child that's experienced that. Shortly after I provide that interview, I get a horrible headache and I have to step away for the rest of the day. Some people call those somatic symptoms, um, but all of the most recent research tells me that it's all one system and those symptoms are real and impacted by how the brain processes that information. So then we have vicarious trauma and vicarious trauma is is much wider of a concept than that secondary uh, stress response. Vicarious trauma is, I have been exposed to some pretty horrible things and it has then impacted my worldview. And the tricky thing about vicarious trauma is it's not a cognitive process. It's not something that you're sitting around thinking like, ah, I'm feeling this way because I have vicarious trauma. So as many of you in this field, I have been exposed to some pretty horrific traumas uh, providing sexual abuse treatment. I, I've worked with many district attorneys. I've testified as an expert witness. I've been a forensic interviewer, interviewing children um, who have been victim to some pretty horrible things. And I started to just believe that I must just be really unique because people would say to me, Ashley, I don't know how you do that. And I'm like, 
of course I do that because someone has to do it and I'm tough enough to do this so I can show up for these kids. I'm not even affected. Silly me. And then I had children. And then I can recall one time being at Macy's with my mother and we needed to change my son's diaper. So we went to the bathroom to do so. And I realized I didn't have the changing mat. I had forgot to put it in the diaper bag. And I, they didn't have any of those disposable ones either. So I had to just put them on um, the changing mat, the changing station in the bathroom and change them. All of a sudden, my child was hysterical. He was crying and I immediately panicked. I immediately started freaking out to my mom and I was saying something must have happened with him. Oh my God, he is associating this changing mat with something that must have happened. He just started daycare. Something must have happened to him at a changing pad at daycare. And my very kind mother looked at me very compassionately and she said, Ash, I think his ass is cold. And it was in that moment that I realized that was probably not a normal response to my child crying with a cold bum at a Macy's changing table. And I can pinpoint that experience to when I started recognizing I am not actually a superhero. I am not actually impervious to the implications of exposure to this work. And what does this mean? What am I experiencing? Are other people experiencing this too? Have I just lost my mind at this point? Um, and that really just encouraged me to start doing some of the research, um, learning what vicarious trauma is. And I was flooded with all the stuff about self-care. Disclaimer, all the self-care self activities, uh, they, didn't, they didn't do it for me. Maybe they, they work for you and kudos to you for that. Uh, I learned throughout my own healing journey that the conversation is much bigger uh, than Prosecco and bubble baths. On the other side of trauma, and what we should always mention when we're talking about trauma is resiliency. I would say that Dr. Bruce Perry says it the best. He says that resiliency factors are more predictive of outcome than adversity and trauma. And that means the more social connections that we can um, have present in our life, the more trusting relationships, more environments that are conducive to our wellness are going to provide that positive outcome, regardless of the traumatic experiences or exposure to experiences. That's what vicarious resiliency is, right? It's our exposure to the resiliency of others. It's when we are working with a survivor and they make progress and you see their healing and they are able to overcome something so beautifully and you had the privilege to be a part of that and it restores this idea that we're only seeing this much of this much of the world and so we start to feel that because we see these horrific things or exposed to these horrific things that that's what the whole world is and it's not there's resiliency and there's vicarious post-traumatic growth uh, that's a journey that I'm on myself like it's just changing your worldview based on those exposures, but in a way that promotes resiliency and understanding how to create meaning making throughout that process. We have some chats. I just want to. I'm so sorry. I'm just trying to look at the chat here. I like, as you say, a baby enter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that experience is very real. <laughs> and I, many, many times in my life, I used to think, I am a therapist. I don't need a therapist. What's another therapist going to be able to tell me that I don't already know? <laughs> Disclaimer, a lot. They actually have told me a lot. So I recommend it. Personal decision. <laughs> physician heal thyself. I can't wait to talk more about that. Love that. Thank you all so much for the participation. It is really my favorite part of being able to present uh, this content. All right. So let's put some pieces together here. So 
we discussed how equal is not always equitable because different barriers, different resources, different uh, ability impact our ability to navigate stressors, impact our ability to complete tasks. The same task does not mean that each person is gonna have the same outcome. During um, the pandemic, huge disparities, huge disparities were illuminated. Uh, there were different groups that experienced uh, the pandemic as a trauma based on societal constructs that limited accessibility to services, lack of inclusion. Uh, in addition, some organizations not having the ability to pivot and create opportunities to meet the needs of their employees and their teams because their teams too are people. And I throw no shade to leaders on this call as one myself. I also recognize the challenges that, that leaders face during the pandemic, the changing rules needing to be a human being, but also showing up for your team and making sure the lights stay on. I see all of that as well. I think it's important to have the conversations. Um, so we know that we're healers and helpers and we were there on the front lines during this pandemic. Some of us felt like we had to be superheroes and move through it. Um, and at the end of the day, our biggest strength, our empathy, that's an auxiliary experience. I am here with you. That also means that you might experience some of that vicarious trauma and stress over a period of time without social supports to mitigate that stressor. That can cause some pretty impactful uh, implications. The chat is just booming. Absolutely. <laughs> Y'all are fun. I like the comments. All right, moving right along. Okay, so I just wanna take a, a little break here and I just wanna ask you how you're doing, how you're feeling. And if you're comfortable, I'd love for you to share that with me in the chat. I'm so sorry, there's so much great feedback and it's hard to keep up with everything. Ashley, I'll also jump in with some. We had somebody say, I might not be able to pay the light bill, but I can bring a candle, which I thought That's was right. really beautiful. We're getting a lot of people feeling seen, exhausted, but grateful. Uh, and some are feeling really good. So we're really happy to hear that. That's great. That's fantastic. I always ask this um, in this training in particular, and it is always so incredible to me how difficult it is for a room of healers to answer this question, honestly. How you doing? I think it's because we're so accustomed to, I'm fine, I'm good, I got this, no problem. Or we ask someone else, like, how you doing? We're not really engaging in connection. Call that an empathy miss, actually. Dr. Brene Brown's work, it's fantastic. We have an opportunity to form a connection. That, that's the buffer. That's how we mitigate um, that tolerable stress from becoming toxic stress. We build the rope. We build a support network so we can get out of the well. So we are not stuck down there too. Um, and also, I love that some people had put in the chat two things. Like I am this and I am this. That's something that we miss a lot too. You're actually allowed to feel more than one thing at the same time. Uh, someone said exhausted and grateful, samesies. So I'm exhausted and I am unbelievably grateful to be here and honored to have this opportunity. I'm allowed to be both things and it doesn't make me ungrateful just because I'm exhausted. It makes me an honest, authentic human being. Thank you all so much for participating and, and sharing a little bit of how you're doing. Yeah. Just looking at, at the chat. Um, Something I always like to mention in this part too is like when we're building our rope, we need to know who our people are. So I will say that not everyone has earned your story. Not everyone has earned your authenticity with exactly how you're doing down to every detail, right? You'll know your people. You'll know your, your trusted confidants who you can really say, I'm not okay. This is why I'm not okay. And, and sometimes I think the hardest thing is being okay with ourselves, just not being okay. 
Because disclaimer, that's like actually just a human experience. That's part of it. Thank you all so much. You're wonderful. I just want to, I'm so sorry. I want to like just respond to, to one of these chats. Um, the intrusive thought, like if I don't have six clients every day, I'm going to get fired. I cannot wait to talk more about that. And I'm just so excited. I think I'm getting ahead of myself. You all are wonderful and I appreciate the, the participation. Okay. So I do have a video clip, but I do not think that we're going to get it, be able to get into the clip today. I want to be cognizant of time and make sure that we have some time for Q&A at the end. But I did ask Rachel if we could send that along later. Um, and she said we could. So that's great news. It's a great TED talk about self-care. And I just think it's really well done. And it challenges that concept that self-care is an activity. I believe the presenter's name is Summer. And she always says Prosecco and bubble baths. Self-care is not just Prosecco and bubble baths. Don't get me wrong. If you love a good bubble bath or Prosecco, I'll never tell you not to. But I think it's a it's about much more than the activity itself. I get so excited about the chats. All right, so we can't actually practice compassion for other people if we don't practice uh, com compassion with ourselves. Self compassion, self love. I've been reading Dr. Brene Brown's work for many years, and that was probably the most disappointing piece of research I had ever found at that point, uh, because that meant I was going to have to really take inventory of how do I talk to myself. I'm a recovering perfectionist, so I had to recognize that I can strive for excellence, and I have to accept that nothing is going to be perfect. After I imploded, I was able to move forward with my journey of learning more about myself and, and how to show up for myself. So I've been doing this particular training since 2019, and the content has evolved so much because I have learned so much about what self-care really is. And that's why I challenge people to look at it as self-compassion and showing up for yourself. All right. All right. So Dr. Uh, Kristen Neff, she is a renowned researcher on this idea of self-compassion. As someone that is a concrete thinker, I like hard edges. I like to know what is what. Life is actually not like that uh, to my dismay, but I love the way that she's able to put some structure to this concept of self-compassion. And she's able to like conceptualize it in these three beautiful categories. I just love it. So mindfulness. As a therapist, I remember, you know, 10, 12 years ago, thinking mindfulness was I'm walking outside and I see that the leaf is green. I am present with the leaf. And I was like, that's not for me. That's not my style as a therapist. It's not for me. And then I started learning what like mindfulness actually is. Mindfulness is when we are able to truly and authentically experience our emotions in any given time without over-identifying with that emotion. So I can feel sad, but it doesn't mean I'm sad. It means there's an unmet need under that feeling. And if I attune to that and I listen to that feeling, I'm able to be present with it. And I'm able to um, acknowledge it and move through it in a way that promotes my wellness opposed to being consumed by that feeling. I am not my feeling. I experience my feeling. On the other side of that is self-kindness. That is one that is just so difficult, I think, especially for healers and helpers. We have this immense ability to offer empathy and compassion to other people, but it's so much harder to turn that inward because we're supposed to be the ones that nurture. We're the ones that take care of people. We don't have time to be taken care of. We got to do better. So it's what are the conversations you're having with yourself? What is that internal dialogue? So if self-care was just an activity, hear me out. And I decided to take a day off because I just needed a break. And I even, I had brunch with some friends and I got a pedicure. I had all the best activities planned. And the whole time I have that day off, I'm thinking, this is so lazy, Ashley. Why would you ever take a day off when you know you have clients to see, you have progress notes that are not done, 
why are you doing this? You should have done better. You didn't need a day off. So that self-care of a day off was not helpful to my well-being. That did not help my overall wellness because of how I responded to myself. And with self-kindness, we have to talk about boundaries too. Like, are we saying yes when we want to? Are we saying no when we need to? And if we say no, are we shaming ourselves about that later? Because if we are, then again, doesn't matter how nice the self-care activity is, it's, it's going to be uh, mitigated in a negative way by how we're talking to ourselves about that experience. Common humanity, another really good one. So Dr. Brene Brown has studied um, shame, vulnerability, joy, really just the human experience for uh, several decades. And what she learned from her qualitative and quantitative research with hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people is that the insecurities that I'm feeling are probably the insecurities that you're feeling and vice versa. We get stuck in this place of thinking, it's just me. I'm the only one that struggles being a mom of two little kids and being an executive at the, at the same time. I'm the only one. And that's just not true. That's what Dr. Kristen Neff means when she says common humanity. We are all experiencing these things. Our experience might be unique, but our experience of shame based on how we're talking to ourselves, that's pretty universal. And it's that cycle that we get into that's actually what leads to our burnout. There's more to that. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about burnout too. I see the chat is, is popping. So I just, oh, y'all are engaging with each other. I love it. Mm. work 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 grind 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 yes in addition to being a recovering perfectionist I am also um hopefully on my road to recovery of being a workaholic so I hear you I see you uh we are all battling that I think society tells us that our worthiness is based in our productivity right so like practicing self-care is revolutionary as as Brene Brown says because it's the opposite of how we're socialized you get praised for not taking time off at certain organizations. You, um, you are like the best employee if you're willing to start early in the morning and, and work all day. There, like how many times do we sit in a room and you hear people brag about, well, I was up till 11 last night doing work. How late were you, 12? Yeah, yesterday it was one, one in the morning I was up. We gotta stop celebrating exhaustion and celebrate healing and wellness. And what do we do to cultivate those environments? Okay, so self-care myths. Love this slide. So self-care is self-indulgent. Self-care is selfish. When I first started training this content, and even for myself, it was almost like I justified this idea that, oh, no, no, self-care is, is okay because it means that um, if I take care of myself, I'll be able to take care of other people. But here's the thing. You actually are just worthy of taking care of yourself just because you're worthy of taking care of yourself, not because you're trying to amp up to take care of somebody else. And I do believe that. I do believe that you must first be able to be compassionate with yourself and show up for yourself to authentically show up for someone else. But that's not the purpose of showing up for yourself. Your purpose of healing and showing up for yourself is because you're worthy of that. You are born worthy and you're still worthy regardless of any other circumstance or factor. So taking care of yourself is not indulgent. It is not selfish. It's preservation. It's wellness. Th that saying, like, if we don't spend time practicing wellness, we'll be making time for illness. Yeah, that's what our profession is literally experiencing right now. How are we preparing for wellness? I think that organizations have a heavy responsibility with that as well. And what are we doing to create environments that people don't have to heal from? Environments that promote wellness. The self-care is one-time experience like we talked about. This will not be a one and done. This should be a journey for you, a path figuring out what is the unique strategy that's gonna work the best for you on your healing journey. And it's not just gonna be one activity. As fun as Prosecco and bubble baths might be, we're going to need a little bit more than that to truly heal. Uh, self-care is time consuming. If you look at it as like a 10-page a self-care plan that you're going to put together for yourself, that's going to be overwhelming. 
it's self-compassion. How are we healing ourselves to move, move forward? So this is a slide that I created. I don't want to take credit for, I'm not sure if I created it, but this is an older slide from a long time ago. Because again, it goes back to this idea that I used to believe until I learned more that we do self-care so we can help other people. I'm going to justify taking care of myself because I need to put my mask on before I can put someone else's mask on. And the conversation is much more dynamic than that. You deserve to have your needs met because you are a human being, period. Like that's the end of that. So Dr. Christina uh, Maslash uh, from Berkeley, she has been studying burnout for many, many years. And she challenges us and says that we are looking at this problem from the wrong angle. We are putting all this pressure on direct service uh, professionals, the healers and helpers of the world to take better care of yourself uh, or you're going to burn out. It's on you that you're burning out. You should have taken that day off. You should have said no to the extra client. But there needs to be more conversation about what are we leaders, myself included, what are we doing to develop environments to support the healers and the helpers, right? There's this idea, Brene Brown talked about it, like having this armor to be able to move through a briar patch until someone said to her, why don't you just get out of the briar patch? That's what this is. We're telling people to armor up for the briar patch. And we need to talk more about how do we get rid of the briar patch? How do we create healing centered environments, true collaboration? As leaders, I think we often are well-intended. We want to do what's best for our teams. We want to show up for them. And sometimes we forget that the best people to ask are our teams. What do they need? And I've heard leaders say, we don't have time to slow down. We don't have time to process or pivot. We have regulations, we have rules. And I hear you, those are all valid, we do. But what all the research tells me is if we don't make time now to discuss the environments that promote, promote wellness, you will see a reduction in productivity. I think it was the who that said, um, we lose about $1 billion due to burnout each year. Like imagine if we had just taken the time to create the environments, to get rid of the briar patch. We're dealing with a whole different consequence that maybe we could have been more proactive about. And again, and again, I mean this so genuinely, I am throwing no shade at any leaders on this call. As a leader myself, I do not nail it every day and I'm gonna keep trying. And the first step is having these conversations and being brave enough to do so. The work that I do, the work that all of you do on this, this call right now, is life-changing for individuals. And you deserve environments that, that foster wellness for you to be able to do this work. I see that I have some chats, some chats. Mm, can you please repeat the podcast by Brene Brown recommended? I don't know if I recommended a podcast, but I got lots of them. So on Audible, she has a like four session series on the power of vulnerability. That one's fantastic. She also has about an hour um, like presentation that you can find on Netflix if you have it. She also has multiple TED Talks that I think are phenomenal. And her books, I also love. Um, Daring Greatly is probably my favorite one that, that she's written. And a lot of the stuff that I have found so the most impactful has been from that book. Atlas of the Heart is also incredible. Um, and I Thought It Was Me, I think is the name of that one. If it's okay with Rachel, I can also send some other resources that I'm familiar with that I've, I've reviewed over the years. Send literally everything you have. This is fantastic. Okay, great. Okay, cool. So I will make sure to send some stuff along. So hopefully you're able to continue some of this, you know, thought, like thinking, thought process, exploration after this training today. Yeah, we will make sure to get those titles out to everybody too. All right. So this slide here, I want to be conscious of time because I would love some, some time for Q&A if that is, um, if people are interested in that. So self-care planning, old language. It's, it's self-compassion and 
um, what can we do to be proactive about developing unique strategies to support ourselves, um, even when sometimes we are in that briar patch. So cultivating uh, awareness, understanding what's working for you, what's not working for you, being attuned to our bodies and how we're responding to certain things tells us so much, but it goes back to that mindfulness, which is actually quite a difficult strategy, or excuse me, a difficult uh, skill to authentically practice mindfulness. Um, but when we're able to attune with our body and, and how we're feeling, it's going to give us a lot of clues on what's working and what's not working. What's causing certain responses? How do you mitigate that response? What's your rope? What is your safety net? What are, who are your trusted people that have earned your story? Um, staying curious, keep it simple. That's really important. Four years ago, when we used to do this training, um, we used to have everyone do like the pro poll assessment to identify like, are you burnt out? Are you experiencing compassion satisfaction? And I think those tools can be helpful depending on context, but we would have people, I think the stress response was very high. Um, while we were having people fill out these like crazy assessments and then trying to write down what is my self-care plan? It became so overwhelming that we lost the point, like the meaning of the content, it was lost because we're focused. I think we, we were focused a little bit on the wrong stuff, even though well-intended. Um, so those tools can be helpful. Feel free to use them if they are. I encourage you to start with self-compassion, challenging the internal dialogue, um, recognizing when you want to say yes and when you need to say no, start putting some of those boundaries personally and professionally as you're able to. And that awareness uh, will happen with how you react during those experiences. And we're also going to be sending lots of resources. So I hope that you continue this research and you continue to explore what might work for you. Because again, every experience is going to require a unique and individualized strategy on what's going to work best for you. Don't be afraid to ask for help. If nothing more, we know that, that the social supports, trusting, loving relationships literally heal. It literally heals the brain, which is wild to me, but it's true. So imagine asking for help when you needed it. Like imagine the healing and the growth that could happen if you asked for what you needed. All right. All right. Just for 30 seconds, I'm going to support you in cultivating some awareness real quick before we uh, close the presentation and move on to Q&A. So I want you just to sit down, clear your mind for a minute. You can write it down or just think about it. I'm going to ask you to reflect on these two concepts, what you're doing to show up for yourself compared to the stressors you're experiencing. I'm going to ask you to do this judgment free because, again, we don't shit on ourselves in here. Uh, we're cultivating awareness, no shame. Take a minute to do that and let me know what that experience is like for you. Boundaries are important. Hallelujah. Boundaries are really, really hard when you're a nurturer and a healer and a helper. I'm going to do it because I can. I'm going to say yes. But what does that then do for, for our well being? We're in the briar patch again. All right. So I hope that um, activity, we're going to skip over this slide. I'm going to send a handout. It's not very readable on the slide. Um, that slide really talks about the eight pillars of self-care and it just identifies that there's so many parts of us to our whole. There's so many different areas to like cultivate that awareness about like spiritual, emotional, physical, like these different areas of our life that we could be examining um, how we can better show up for ourselves in those ways. So I think we have gotten to our Q and A portion of our training today. I do want to make sure to remind everyone to complete the survey that will be sent out. Feedback is invaluable. As I shared in my presentation today, the reason the content is where you see it today is because people provided me feedback for the last four years. Um, and that has really grown this content to, to being something I think is um, really helpful and beneficial to start some of these conversations.
Thank you so much, Ashley. While we wait for some people to either pop some questions in the chat, in the Q&A, or I know we have a few minutes if anybody wants to raise their hand, we may be able to get some. I'm sure we won't get to our, our the question. I'm sorry, what? Oh, I'm going to pass it to Billy because my audio is bad. You're doing great, Rachel. <laughs> Um, yeah, stay tuned. So the recording for this webinar will be sent out, you know, once we get it uploaded. Slides are going to be made available as well. Any of the additional resources that Ashley shares with us, we will make sure you get everything. Look at that, Rachel's already on it. We got the slides and the evaluation link right there. Um, but yeah, please share. I also have one thing I want to add. Well, oh, Rachel wants to add one more thing. You're going to be cut out. <laughs> Hi there. So one other thing I've just put into the chat, uh, we have a forum, an online forum for our funded advocates and allied professionals called vapconnect.com. I've actually created a healing the helper thread because we're seeing such amazing communication and sharing of resources. Please feel free to join. It takes a couple of days to get approved, but share your link, share your podcast, continue that conversation there, and you can pop around and see a lot of other interesting things. So please, please, please check that out. Ashley, you're fabulous. I'm going to go out of frame. Thank you. All right. I want to see if we have some Q&A here. Okay. Someone had asked earlier, just out of curiosity, are there studies on business owners in COVID? I have a client where she already had trauma and then more as a restaurant owner. I can say that I have not personally um, reviewed any of that research, but based on what you're sharing, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, that individual, because they've previously experienced trauma, were then faced with more adversity, more challenges, and their uh, threshold, their window of tolerance to be able to navigate those stressors was impacted due to previous experience. And then I'd be curious about uh, what were their social buffers? What supports did they have in place to be able to mitigate that exposure to ongoing stress? Because again, negative stress can become chronic toxic stress. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So I live in a small apartment with a young child at home. Sometimes I don't know where I can physically go to sort out my self, self-care, self-talk, especially in the winter when I can't step outside. Any tips? I love that you said that you're trying to make a list of people that you can process with. So something that I think is super important that we didn't really touch upon enough in the training today is there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is I did something that wasn't very good. I'm going to change that thing. And shame is I am bad. So I cannot change that because that is innately who I am. And Dr. Brene Brown's work talks so much about how we shame ourselves and we expect better of ourselves without any self-compassion and humanity for ourselves. So I, I just want to be able to say that out loud for everyone. And there is a difference between finding things that comfort you and then using things to numb. That's also really relevant when we're talking about our healing journeys. So when you're at home with a small child, I have a couple of them myself. Um, they can really increase that cortisol level. So maybe you don't have time to physically uh, separate. I, I wonder, and I encourage, you know, the opportunity to find those uh, experiences when able, but how can you be kind to yourself in those moments? How can you recognize that maybe, you know, you might feel bad about something, but you are not bad. You are, you are not what the shame gremlins say, right? There's a lot to read. I'm so sorry. Ooh, I, I was wondering if I'd get this question. Any advice working with organizations to change the larger culture? Yeah, uh, I would start with a conversation and that's gonna be super vulnerable and will take a lot of courage. Um, you could even say, you could start the conversation. I met this crazy lady named Ashley. She was saying some things. I'm wondering if we could just kind of talk about that content and just get the conversation started. Um, reviewing Dr. Christina Maslash work, professor of Berkeley, really dives into the cost to an organization for not practicing self-care and not supporting self-care of workers. Um, so 
what we do at family counseling, what we really strive for is we know what our absolutes are. We know what we have to do to keep the lights on. And now how do we support our teams with uh, flexibility to get to those objectives? So that can be flexible scheduling, um, voice and choice and caseload, um, PTO. We have processing groups to support wellness. There are things that could be at very little cost to an organization that can promote like huge uh, benefits to the employees. And again, what research tells me is you'll save money and you'll see an increase in productivity when you slow down to do that. So maybe just like give them some facts there and try to have that vulnerable conversation. I'm not sure if I am missing any here. I think there were a couple more over here. Oopsie. I think I think one of the elephants as leaders maybe haven't had time to discuss because the past three years have been a whirlwind. Yep, yep. Burnout was big. Now it's the norm. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that. So we just kind of expected ourselves as leaders just to keep working, keep working, keep working. When we we're all working from home or like working remote or out in the communities, there wasn't really separation between professional and personal. So I think what happened when we were in that neo-normal kind of experience, it became the norm that all of those things just blend together, work and life. And I think we have to review collectively, what did we like from the pandemic? Uh, well, whoa, let's slow down. No one liked anything from the pandemic. Uh, what I mean is what did we implement that we could still use right now? And what didn't work? What should we get rid of? So one of the things for us is we realized our therapists and advocates can work remotely. Not every individual needs to be in the office to do their job. And that's allowing them flexibility and choice when they're already doing really hard work that sometimes they don't feel like they have control over. So what can we keep and what was never working in the first place? I think those are some of the conversations. I can remember sitting at my kitchen table trying to develop a telehealth system on a Zoom call with the president and CEO of our company. And my, my three-year-old was putting train tracks through my hair. Like it was a wild time to be alive. Um, so whatever we can do to hold on to the things that worked and get rid of the things that never worked, I think that's what we should be doing. Absolutely. Okay. Can you explain mindfulness and how to transition from letting an emotion consume you to acknowledge that emotion and being able to move on from it? I'm so, it's so hard for me to read these chats. It's incredible. Um, yeah, I'd love to talk about that. So that's what I learned about mindfulness too. Cause again, it's not just, I see a green leaf. The leaf is blowing in the wind. It's being able to be attuned to your body and how you're feeling when you experience an emotion. So it's the power and the pause. Let's say I'm very angry. I'm not an angry person. I'm feeling angry. So how do I pause and really have a conversation with myself about where that emotion is coming from? Not shame myself for having that emotion, saying it's okay, I'm feeling this way. I'm a human and that's what humans do. We have messy emotions. Identifying that that anger means something. Your emotion is telling you something. Getting to the root of that by getting to the root of that, you're acknowledging it. You're acknowledging that that emotion is anger. And then you can problem solve. What am I needing in this moment? Sometimes emotions mean, there's, mean that there is an unmet need. So how do we meet that need to be able to move through it without feeling guilt or shame that we experience that emotion? That's what mindfulness, mindfulness is. Dr. Kristen Neff, uh, her website has incredible resources and tools. And one of them is actually a self-compassion uh, like assessment. I think that that is a very helpful tool. All right, I know I have more up here and I'm trying to. It's like when I click on it, I just lose the other ones. This is why I usually have Katie, our executive coordinator to help me with the, this stuff. My Zoom um, abilities is very limited to being able to share my screen and unshare my screen, so. I'm going to do my I, best. I can help you out too. What are you trying to look at? I also noticed we do have somebody with their hand up as well. Oh, okay. I'm just struggling to like look at one chat and then I lose the other one and I just am losing That's my okay. shot. I've got everything up. So I just saw the elephants one, which we talked about, correct? I think so. 
Okay. So I yeah. saw that, some, and if I'm repeating anything, I'm sorry. I've been setting up, I've seen people come to our VAP Connect, and I've been trying to approve them. Um, and yes, we can stop showing the presentation. It'll make your picture go bigger. Oh, might yeah. make it so you can see some more things. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Look at that. See, I can do that. I'm really good at that. So I did see somebody says it just hopeless as a helper when they aren't taking steps to remove the bio patch. I believe we already spoke about that. I think we have answered every question that was in the Q&A. Okay, cool. And then we had a, can you talk about moving from my work does not impact me to it impacts me and this is how. How do you switch through those? Sorry. I'm so I, sorry. I'm, so was bad. I'm sorry. Can you, can you stop in? We'll get you there. I see that someone in the chat had, um, so sorry, take it away, Blake. No, you, you got it. I'm sorry, I was just scrolling down. I know, I'm just worried that I'm missing some and I do see that someone has raised their hand. I don't really know what to do with that. Do I hit the view button? You can unmute them. Oh, okay. You should be able to. Okay, so I will just go ahead and unmute this person. Yeah, see if it Dina? works. Okay, let's see, Tina, can we hear you? I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh no, Tina, you had your hand raised, so I thought you wanted to be unmuted. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay, happy to hear from you, Tina. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. All right. Ashley. Yes. Hi. The Hi, one Katie. that you were missing, what that um, Rachel was speaking to, was can you talk about moving or moving from my work does not impact me phrase to it impacts me and this is how? Yeah. So our work does impact us. Our work. I want to make sure that I'm understanding the question without being able to see it. So our work does impact us because we are we are human beings. Every experience impacts us and how we experience our work and new experiences is, is filtered through previous experiences. I wish I could see that one to make sure that I'm understanding the question fully. I see another hand raise. I'm going to try again. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm the one that asked that question. So I'm just okay. going to clarify. So, um, so I've been working in victim services for like five years now, and um, I, I just feel like I feel kind of like kind of like how you said at the beginning that at the beginning, you know, you weren't, you kind of thought like it wasn't impacting you. And I feel like I'm still in that phase. I don't. I don't feel like vulnerable and stuff. Or so. I, but but I believe that I'm. I'm sure that there are ways that it's impacting me that I'm not cognizant of and addressing. So kind of my question was like, how do you? Can you make some suggestions as to how to start moving from that? You know, like the oh, you know, this is not impacting me phase to the okay, it's impacting me and this is how, this is how and this is how I'm gonna address it phase. Yeah, I think that that is a fantastic question. And I wanna just stress that everyone's experience is gonna be different. I don't want anyone feeling like they, if you're not feeling impacted, looking for ways that might be impacting you. And I also hear you, just as I said, often when we are experiencing vicarious trauma or even secondary stress response, we're not recognizing it as that. So for me, that story that I shared with my son and my mom at Macy's, that was that moment for me. I had been two years doing the work at that time. And it took that experience to slow me down to say, whoa, that's not actually a normal way to respond. And then that's what, what started my self-exploration. So for anyone curious about that for themselves, 
I think the first step is really being attuned to your experience, be attuned to how you're feeling. If you're noticing um, certain views that, that maybe you didn't have before, taking a look to see if maybe your work has impacted that. Um, being aware of like that mindfulness, right? Like how are you feeling at any given time? And then just being curious. I think the most important thing is to be attuned with yourself and be curious about why and what you're feeling and then start the exploration. And it really might be the case that you are exposed to traumas and you are experiencing stressors and you have the appropriate safety, uh, felt trust, an environment that promotes your wellness as well as people that have earned your story, trusting people that are able to mitigate that stress for you. So it could be a number of those things, very individualized experience. Thank you so much for asking that and letting me practice um, unmuting someone again. That was cool. Thank you. <laughs> all right, I think that I may have gotten through all the questions. I don't know if anyone else saw anything that maybe I did not. I think we did it. Oopsie. Oh, no problem, Tina. Happy to have you here. Uh, Patricia had a question. I think maybe Rachel or Blake would be better to answer than myself. Yeah, and the next day or so, you'll get a confirmation email that includes this confirms your attendance, blah, blah, blah. And usually in that email too, we'll include links that to recordings if we have it available by then, if not the evaluation link for sure. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, oh, just wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. All right. Oh, someone said, how can I manage that? I'm so sorry. It's just going so fast now. I want to make sure to at least take that last question before we sign off with these fabulous people. I believe the beginning part of that was I always feel overworked and feel guilty taking time off. So how does that person manage that? So the, the question is, uh, being overworked and then feeling guilty that we're feeling overworked and managing that. Um, and taking the time off to manage that, feeling the guilt around mm -hmm. time off. Yeah, absolutely. I can, That resonates with me. I feel that. I get that. First and foremost, I want to just say that you can feel two things at once, like we talked about today. You can be grateful for the opportunity to work and also be exhausted and overwhelmed by the work that you're doing all at the same time. Both things are valid and it is about challenging any negative self-talk. It's about challenging that internal dialogue that you are worthy for that time off. You are worthy to take care of yourself. Like, again, I love the oxygen mask um, metaphor. Yeah. Like you have to put your oxygen mask on before you put someone else's on and that's valid. And you are worthy of putting the oxygen mask on even if no one else is going down on the ship with you, like you're allowed to do that. You're deserving of that. You're born worthy and you are worthy right now. And remember, if we're not taking time for wellness, we will have to take time for illness later. We got to show up to take care of ourselves. I think I'm, I don't know if I had missed anything. That was well said. All right, if I missed any questions, can can someone send them to me later? I just want to make sure that I'm getting to every everything that won't. Well, that's wanted. it. Yeah, that's one. Okay, excellent. All right, awesome. So if I missed anything, I will. I promise that when presented with the questions, I will get back to you. Uh, thank you all so much for this opportunity. You've been a great and engaged group, and I hope that I have encouraged some further thinking and self exploration for your own journey. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.
Sí. Thank you. Have a great day.